Good morning, B1. Welcome back. I know what you're thinking. Didn't you just mess that up? Yeah, yeah, I did. Technology is wonderful when it works. It doesn't always work. When it doesn't work, we got to fix it. We do it. We move on. That's how we are. Of course, I get the added pleasure of going back and, of course, adjusting that in the 73 different places that I have to adjust it in order to make it come back okay. <laughs> but we're going to do that. Hey, man, go ahead. Um... While I'm finishing up, unmessing up the things that are messed up, uh, da, 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 I know, everybody's good morning on the other post. And um, by the way, the good morning still hold for this post too. <laughs> Delete that one from page so that people don't get mixed up when they head over this direction. All right, here we go. All right, so Cheryl, Tom, and Debbie made it over here. We'll see if the rest of the group gets over here as well. Again, apologize for the technical difficulties this morning. That being said, hope you're already over in Isaiah 23. I, I can't believe I actually get to say this, but I'm going to say it. This is the penultimate episode about our current woe section of Isaiah. We have one more woe section after this when the whole earth is going to get judged. And then we're going to have some chapters of actual redemption and the work of God and, and the beauty of how that's going to be. However, comma... We have a few more woes to get through, and today we're going to deal with the woes to the city of Tyre. Now, the city of Tyre is a very interesting city if you're a huge nerd. Um, as it happens, I'm a huge nerd, so we're in luck. Um, I always like Tyre because Tyre has an interesting historical um, history that people, a lot of people don't understand. Uh, for instance, the main enemy of Rome that caused Rome to be the empire that Rome was, was the city of Carthage. The city of Carthage was actually a colony established by the city of Tyre. Tyre and Sidon's were, Tyre and Sidon, outside of, um, oh gosh, what's the big, what was the big, <laughs> what was the big, uh, Philistine capital? Ekron? I can't think of it. Hey, good morning, Annette. Um, good morning, everybody else, as, you get, get, as you're getting back in the stream. Sorry uh, for that. Um, yes, hello again, Nicole. But Tyre and Sidon were very important Phoenician cities. They were very important Canaanite cities. Guess who comes from Sidon? Jezebel. Dun, dun, dun. There's a dramatic music that plays whenever you say the name. Jezebel. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, she was actually from that city. They had a very complicated relationship with the people of Israel. They were, when Israel was established as a nation, very good, good friends with them. Uh, in fact, David, when he builds the temple, I believe uh, Tyre and Sidon provide some of the materials for building the for uh, building the temple. So David actually sets aside all the materials. Um, or a lot of the materials so that Solomon will have them to build the temple with um, because David wasn't allowed to build the temple. But he's like, I can at least, I can at least take, gather everything for you. I was telling my son yesterday, my son's into carpentry. My dad was uh, really good at carpentry, and I was only allowed to hold the boards that he cut and measured because I was, I was good neither at cutting straight nor at measuring things. To which my wife was like, well, you know, you could practice. And I was like, yeah, but what's more important to my current occupation, knowing how to cut a board straight or understanding the historical context of Isaiah? I chose Isaiah, and that's why we're here today. So another thing about Tyre and Sidon, um, when we get to the end of this, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the ministry of Jesus and how he actually goes to Tyre and Sidon, how in the book of Acts it's actually mentioned as a place where a church is at. But before all of that, see, here in Ezekiel, we're talking, you know, four, five hundred, six hundred years before Christ enters the scene, they are slowly distancing themselves from Israel and becoming an Israel of the, an enemy of the people of God. Um, welcome back, Mona. Sorry for the uh, technical difficulties. I, I'm just going to throw this out there, that my mind is in a lot of places today, um, because really I want to be in the next chapter of Isaiah, but I feel like if the Lord has us in this chapter, then this is a chapter he has us in. I had a conversation yesterday um, with, we had uh, several pastors in the area, kind of met over here at the church. Um, we talked about what's going on, about our reopening plans, about um, the governor and, and the, the things that are coming against the church right now. And I do say coming against the church because uh, I do believe churches will be, and, and, and are be, in, in, in every um, 
in every meaningful way, churches are being singled out right now. And, and it's one of those things when people used to say, whenever anybody tells you it's not about the money, it is always about the money, right? The reason they're saying it's not about the money is because they know it's not about the money, but they don't want it to be about the money. But the truth is it's about the money. When it comes to a lot of the gathering restrictions, understand that they are going to be singling out churches, that the restrictions are specifically tailored so that, I mean, aside from large sporting events, churches are the only ones affected, right? I mean, where else are your large gatherings restricted? Not at the Walmarts, not at the department stores, not at the grocery stores, not at all the other places where you'd have large groups of people, just at the churches. Um, and that's been on my mind. And all through this, and this is one of the things that I've, I've kind of... It made me happy is that when all this began, I had a we had a meeting of pastors, and this was this was at the beginning of March. We had our BCMA meeting, and um, I brought up COVID at the BCMA meeting on March. It was whatever the first Wednesday in March was, and I said the word I'm getting from the Lord is that this is just the beginning of sorrows. That you know what's going on is is just you know it's going to be a long drawn out process, and. Um, those pastors remembered that I said that and uh, have been bringing it back up to me that, you know, that I had. And then the next word that I got from the Lord was in Isaiah, don't call a conspiracy everything these people call a conspiracy, which is one of the reasons why I decided um, as a personal project to take up Isaiah during this time. Because I feel like if you have these times of enforced Sabbath or enforced fasting, um, that you should do something with that time, making the most of the time. Because the other side of that is, is that I am a naturally rebellious person who wants to um, rebel against the government, against its overreach, against the injustice of it all. And yet the Lord's hand has stayed me thus far. But in my meeting with the pastors yesterday, my main question for them was, where's the line, right? What's the point at which it goes so far that we can no longer, as a church, stay silent? And, and I think one of the issues that the church is going to run into is that we all rush into battle separately um if i can if i can teach you one thing about tactics and warfare in particular is that if you're fighting a large army the last thing you want to do is to feed your troops into it piecemeal meaning you have this large monolithic problem and you're just throwing a couple of guys at it that it easily defeats and then another couple of guys that it easily defeats that eventually you're going to wear your own army down and have no progress in actually taking down uh, the enemy arrayed against you, and I fear that is what the church is going to do, that when we go to battle, I want to save my strength for the right battle at the right time, that I want um, what voice I have as a pastor to be used to the greatest effect for the kingdom of God and not for my own pride or rebelliousness or my own natural desire to um, strike out against injustice because the, the, there is an injustice to it. And this actually ties into Isaiah almost coincidentally because the injustice of the city of Tyre in chapter 23 is that it's an injustice of wealth. That wherever you have wealth, you have the possibility for injustice because um, sometimes it's a zero-sum game, meaning some people are getting rich while other people are getting poor. Some people hoard the wealth while other people um, – uh, yeah, sorry, Robin. Uh, take care. Um there's always the there's always a potential for injustice there. There's particularly a potential for injustice when you have a group of people who are not affected by their decisions making decisions over the lives of people who will be affected. Um, that always has the possibility for injustice. And there's a large part of me that it really, really eats at my soul. Um, but I know that I know what I'm supposed to do this week. How about that? I know where the Lord has me this week. I know what he's been saying to me this week. I walked around this morning, and when I put my hands on the cross outside, I heard kind of from him a specific word that I need to sit on, but I know, right, what I need to do this Sunday. Um, but I don't know about next Sunday, and I don't know the future, and God doesn't always lay the whole thing out, you know, all the way through. Um, even in Ezekiel, as we go th or Ezekiel, even in Isaiah, as we go through a lot of these prophecies, he doesn't lay it out. He doesn't, you know, some of the things that we're going to read about Tyre and Sidon, right, to get back to the text, um, he's not going to, he's not going to give the step by step all the way. And not only that, but there's something about the Spirit of God that I have found in the course of my life that he does not like to be 
um, predicted. Not not that he doesn't call his shots and say where he's going to go, but if you say God has to do a certain thing in order to make a certain thing happen, because like say you know this thing is of the will of God, right? You know this is where God wants to go with it, and you say, well, the only way God can get me here is this path right here. It almost always seems like he closes that path specifically and has you take another path to get to where it's supposed to be. So there's this part of me that understands that no matter how much I try to guess at the will of God or try to, you know, corner him into where I think he needs to go that he has a plan that is beyond you know my ability to plan out for him right which is good because I only have a limited ability to plan out for him but I know he has a plan and I know there are principles at work here there's the principle that we as Christians cannot stand by while injustice happens and not do anything about it and I'm glad we have a food pantry because I'm glad at least I can say in the midst of all the crap I see going on my church is feeding the people that are hungry but I also have this part of me that had to talk on the phone as a friend of mine had her mother dying in a nursing home that I couldn't go stand beside. And that's my place. I mean, that's that's who I am as a pastor. That's that part of me that wants to reach out. There's that part of me that understands that people are being genuinely hurt by this. And there's the feeling of powerlessness. That the people who are in charge are not going to listen. That they're not going to care because it does not affect them. Because they're not in the cars outside the pantry on Thursdays, right? They're not, they're not here needing help because they have the resources, because they have what they need already. So it doesn't affect them, and yet they make the decisions for those that do. And then they're the people out here. We're going to have to pick up the pieces of what happens. And so there's a natural injustice about that. <laughs> and that I don't like. <laughs> this podcast is turning into a train wreck. Oh. But it's been heavy on my heart. I put my hand on the cross this morning. I cried out to the Lord. I know that he's got a plan, and I know that there's another principle at work, and that principle is this, that you always make room for the justice of God. I have had over the past year people come against me, try to destroy me in my ministry. And, and, and to me, it, it seemed like for no reason because... I love them. I still love them. I still pray for my lost children out there. But what I learned was this, that there are times where people come against you, where you suffer injustice, where you suffer persecution, where you suffer through things, and you don't fight because God is going to fight. And the problem is, is that we always want to take up arms and fight the battle for God and do for him what he has set aside for himself. Because we say, Lord, the only way this injustice is going to pass is if I rant and scream and yell and come against these people and I go out there and give it to them. And God says, if you'll be still and know that I am God, that I will handle this and the whole thing will fall apart by my hand and not yours. And that there's a point in which I have to understand even as a pastor who wants to use his voice to rail against this, that my job as a pastor is not to rail against, but my job is to feed the people, to comfort those that are afflicted, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that there's no amount of restrictions. There's nothing that any government can do that can stop the word of God. And if there's an impotence, an absolute impotence in the highest parts of all of our government to do anything outside of what God has already decreed. It is the pride of nations that we see in Isaiah over and over again, that they rise up and say, I am this and I can do this. In fact, let's, let's do this because you can take Isaiah 23. Guess what? We're in a pronouncement against Tyre. I'm going to go right over to Ezekiel 27 because guess what's in Ezekiel 28, right? Yeah, Ezekiel 28. I didn't underline it. I haven't even been to this part of my Bible in my new Bible. My Bible's new enough that I haven't been to Ezekiel 28 in it. But it's the same thing. The word of the Lord again uh, came to me. Son of man, go say to the rule of Tyre. This is what the Lord 
your God says, your heart is proud and I have, and you have said, I am a God. I sit in the seats of God in the heart of the sea, yet you are a man and not a God. And though you've regarded in your heart as that of a God, yes, you are wiser than Daniel. No secret is hidden by, from you. By your wisdom and understanding, you've acquired wealth for yourself. You've acquired gold and silver in your treasuries. By great skill and trading, you've increased your wealth, but your heart has become proud of your wealth. Therefore, this is what the Lord God says, because of the regard of your heart that as because you regard your heart as that of a God, I am about to bring strangers against you, ruthless men from the nations. They will draw swords against your magnificent wisdom and will pierce your splendor. They will bring you down to the pit. You will die a violent death in the heart of the sea. Will you say, I am a God in the presence of those who slay you? You will be only a man, not a God, in the hands of those that kill you. Now, in this, in, in Ezekiel, I am trying so hard to get this back. <laughs> get this back on track in Ezekiel when he's talking about the king of Tyre just like here in Isaiah that it is an archetype of the adversary of the church it is an archetype of Satan right then we read Ezekiel 28 against Tyre when we read um, Isaiah I think it was 14 when we read Isaiah 23 we have the archetypes of the adversary against the church and it is not hard to see the hand of the enemy moving against the church in times like these and the biggest battle is not against governments. It's not against the people in the governments. The big battle is in, in the hearts of the people who agree with those governments, especially here in America where we put them in power ostensibly, right? That there are people who are already drawing lines, right? There are people who want to call churches not compassionate for wanting to meet together. Christians are being selfish because they want to have gatherings, I mean, it's literally coming out of people's mouth. And I don't eat, you know, like, like, where's even the logic in that? You're selfish for wanting to meet together. You're literally endangering people and trying to, and trying to hurt them. And that's why as a church, we're trying so hard, right, to ensure the safety of all of our people. We're trying so hard to feed the community. We're trying to so hard to do the things that we know are the right things to do. But the enemy is using the current crisis to come against us, and there's just no getting around that. But God is going to use his church. God is going to protect his church. That we are the daughters of Zion. We are his precious children, right? He's not going to, he's not going to let the car hit us. He's going to pull us out of the road when the time comes, right? And then I do earnestly believe this whole thing is going to come falling down around their heads. Those who have designed these things against the church. You can make designs against the people of God. You can raise your siege engines. You can put them up against the walls. But the city of God will stand. We are crushed but not forsaken. Persecuted but not in distress. Right? Downcast but not in despair. No, I'm killing that. I'm quoting that. I have tried to memorize that verse my whole life. And every time the translations change, I try to memorize it in a new translation. And I've never gotten that 1 Corinthians verse right. Even though it's one of my favorite verses that we carry about in, our, in, these, in these earthen vessels, in these clay bodies, the treasures of the kingdom of God. That what is in us cannot be taken away from us by any government edict, by any situation that comes up against us. And yes, I have had a whole lot of wrath in my heart over the past couple of days over all this nonsense that's been going on. And, and sometimes, you know, hearing the frustrations of my fellow pastors, hearing the frustrations of the people um, who are also going through this to see the suffering of the people who, who don't have jobs or income or, or ways of feeding their families and, and that the decisions are made by people who will continue um, that already have enough money to survive. And, and even if they didn't, they continue to collect taxes and pay themselves in the face of denying other people the ability to feed themselves. There's a there's an injustice in that. I actually want it to get done early today. Today is the National Day of Prayer at 7 o'clock. There is on the National Day of Prayer um, site a, um, a video um, that pastor bell over at first united methodist has put out at nine o'clock um i will be praying on their site um and that will be broadcast so i want to be off early enough that you know you guys can see that as well um so let me kind of i'm just going to do this read chapter 23 on your own this is obviously not a great study of chapter 23 other than to say a couple of different things um one that whenever you read against Tyre and Sidon that you're reading one, the Phoenician culture, um, which was literally the culture that presses in against Israel. These are the worshipers of Baal. When I said that they go and found Carthage, 
one of the things they have found in Carthage are these mass infant cemeteries. Oh, wow. We're <laughs> and I already see where the Lord's going with this. All right. So the city of Phoenicia, right, Tyre and Sidon, they were these Canaanite religions. They worshipped um, the Baals and the Asherahs and the Molechs and those type of gods, and they did offer their children as sacrifices at times. That Carthage becomes the great enemy of Rome, and there's a thing called the First and Second Punic War, in which Rome goes to in, goes to war against Carthage. If you know about the name Hannibal, Hannibal is one of the great generals of Carthage, where all of these are descendants of Tyre and Sidon. And the reason I say that is because when they've gone and excavated Carthage, and Carthage was ruined by the Romans, and by the way, Tyre and Sidon definitely get theirs. Um, Tyre was a very proud city that basically thumbed their noses up at Alexander the Great because they're like, ha, who are you? Alexander the Great literally destroys the city on the coast because Tyre is an island, is an island fortress. He destroys the cities that exist on the coast and use the rubble of those cities to build a bridge out to Tyre so that he can whoop them thoroughly and utterly and has very little mercy on the city. So the destruction that he's predicting here comes to pass in a major way. That city does not long, he no longer exist. Nobody ever rebuilds it. Ezekiel also talks about the city being destroyed utterly and never rebuilt, and that happens. And even in here, when you see the word in verse 3, where it talks about the desert creatures come up and set up a siege tower, that that's an image of the demonic things actually strolling in the streets of this thing. Anytime those desert creatures, those howling animals, again, those are references to demonic images that he is directly correlating with Tyre and Sidon. Anyway, when they excavate in Carthage, they find the mass graves of babies that they sacrificed all of these infants in the Punic Wars and in their history to try to curry favor with their gods. And so you come back to our modern day argument of churches are closed and abortion clinics are empty, right? or churches are, and abortion clinics are open. They were still sacrificing our young for our wealth, for our pleasure, because, you know, um, I, I, would, I, would actually, I would actually make provision for abortion in the case where the mom's life is threatened, right? Where there could be great physical harm there. But we know, you know, in cases of rape and incest, right? I'd, I, I would make provision for that because sometimes it's, it's a horrible situation and there's no good, there's no good answer. But I can tell you this, that I think statistically you can, you can come back to that, that 98% of abortions are really more about economic prosperity. They're more about convenience of lifestyle. They're more about sacrificing our babies for the wealth of our own lives than they are about any sort of medical condition or about anything like that. And that's the sad part there, right? that the same Phoenicians that were willing to sacrifice their children in order to maintain their wealth, to appease their gods, so that they could, they could rule over the waves as they did, right? And here we are, 1,000, 2,000 years later, still sacrificing our children for our wealth. And let's not, let's not just put it in the context of abortion. Let's put it in the context of this. How many parents aren't going to spend time with their children because they're too busy at their job? They're too busy at their work. How many, how many single moms can't spend time with their children, can't raise their children the way they want to because they have to go out and work because of the results of being a single mom and the things, you know, the, the breakdown of the family in our culture? Right? How many of how many children are being sacrificed in our culture so that we can economically prosper? I want to get I want to go to verse sixteen and kind of stop with that um, because verse sixteen is just beautiful in its own tragic way. Start in verse fifteen. On that day, Tyre will be forgotten for seventy years, the lifespan of one king. At the end of seventy years, what song the pro what the song says about the prostitute will happen to Tyre what the song says about the prostitute. So I kind of wrote in my notes here that Tyre is going to sing the song of an old whore. Pick up your lyre, stroll through the city, you forgotten prostitute, play skillfully, sing many a song so that you will be remembered. And so the image here is of a, of a woman who used to sell herself in order to provide for herself, but the beauty has passed and she has nothing left to sell. So she plays the sad song on the lyre so that people will remember who she was. And I can even take this into the male area, too, because in the male area, you have the man who thought that love was about conquest, and through all his life, he's going from one conquest to another conquest. And so he finds at the end of his life, after cheating on wife after wife, that he's there dying alone with no one with him, 
because love was never about conquest. And that the little boy inside of him that felt rejected and unloved was never met through those conquests. And so you have the old man singing the song of a lonely person who's surrounded by no one and dying alone. But here's the thing. Even 23, with all of its woes and all of its imagery, does not end there. It ends in chapter 17 that says the Lord is going to restore it. 18, her prophets and wages will be dedicated to the Lord. They will not be stored or saved, for her prophet will go to those who live in the Lord's presence to provide for them with ample food and sacred clothing. And for your additional reading, Matthew 15, 21 Mark 7, 24 through 30, Acts 21, 3 through 4, and I'll put those in the comments. Um, all talk about the ministry that si Tyre and Sidon are going to have. Jesus is going to visit close to those places, perhaps in those places. In Acts 21, there is a church there, and the presence of God is established there in those coastal cities. That The end of the story is always the redemption, that God's plan is always redemption, that he is moving to redeem his children. With that, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. It's 7 o'clock. Head over to the National Day of Prayer Task Force. Watch the message by Jim Bell. If you have time, please. It's a good message. I recorded it myself, and I'm going to be on that site praying at 9 a.m. this day. I hope you join me for that as well. Until then, be real, be loved, be one. And learn how to click the in the broadcast button because apparently today is that special kind of train wreck in which I do everything. Come on, baby. My computer's going to do it. I, I believe in it. And...